Awesome, Claudia. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Claudia Thomas with Claudia and, her, and Friends, and her website is 9-11, rescueworkersandfriends.org. Okay, well, tell us what's on your mind today, Claudia. Well, we're very excited to um, announce, although, you know, it's, it should be common knowledge by now, that our Zadroga bill did get passed on Friday. And not only did it get passed on Friday, but um, the president also signed off on it, so it's a done deal. We did receive our um, permanent coverage on our health care, which will carry us through to 2090, which will be well after most of us are gone. And um, uh, we got a five-year extension on the compensation component side of the bill. So we're very um, satisfied with how this uh finally turned out and it was a lot of uh, a lot of work but it's done and we're very happy that it's done and that said we can talk maybe some more on that a little later on I, I can tell you that it was attached to the um, omnibus or the spending bill and it, the omnibus actually passed with 72 yays and 26 nays and uh, so it was all signed off on and, and a done deal on Friday so a lot of us are breathing a great sigh of relief, um, having that stress taken off of us about our health care, especially, is a huge burden that's been lifted. Well, I have no idea what it's like to be yourself or other people that have volunteered their services to respond very quickly to the 9-11 event and then... Uh, work there for a period of days, weeks, months, and in some cases, I'm sure, years. And then um, politics came into play for a while, and, and that had to be pretty scary. So I'm glad that there's a, 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 a clear uh, position where the 9-11 rescue workers are, are they know that they're going to be taken care of as there shouldn't have been any politics in it at all, period. So, but but it's done, and uh, you guys, uh, uh, you know, now you're ready to, to live on, live your life like you deserve to. Yes. Okay. Well, no one else is evidently on the uh, on conference, uh, so it's you and us, Claudia. Well, and that's... That's okay, you know. It's uh, and tell us about Liam. Tell tell us about who he is. Well, um, Liam was a uh, responder to the World Trade Center at the time of his response. He had been assigned with the U.S. Army um, CBRN Corps officer, and of course, he'd have to explain some of the acronyms because we all know when you're in the military, you just need to buy a vowel. <laughs> to get through all those acronyms. And I remember that serving overseas. It, it was uh, mind-boggling. Everything's an acronym. Um, at the time, he had been posted on a temporary duty assignment from the Soldiers Biological and Chemical Command, which was actually out of Aberdeen Edge, uh, Wood, um, Maryland, which was really fascinating when he and I were talking about that because I also worked at SBC Com uh, for... It was after that time, and I started there in May of 2002, so it seemed like we had some items in common in that regard, for sure. Um, but she, he was, uh, it'll be a lot easier when he's online because he can explain all this a lot easier, and he, he should be calling back in any second. Um, he, I know he has initially started out at the site working at the triage station over at the morgue uh, over at Liberty Plaza, and then he wound up on the bucket brigades in the pile outside the World Trade Center, and he was assisting the fire department, of course, and everybody else. So that said, um, he did get um, slightly injured by some foreign concrete that day, but, uh, you know, uh, went back and, and kept working on things. And now he's uh, retired from the military and living in Florida. But he was a responder. Although he was assigned through Maryland, he responded from uh, Connecticut, which... Um, hold on. Can you go ahead and fill in for me? Maybe you could read that essay while I get people back on the okay, line Jeff, with us. Jeff will read the essay as you try to get him back on the line. Go ahead, Jeff. Do you have okay. it pulled up? Yes. 
Uh, it's entitled Not a Christmas Gift, uh, Zadroga 911 Healthcare and Compensation Act 2010 and 2015. There have been several references made to the passage of our Health Care and Compensation Act as being a Christmas gift. While certainly no malice is behind those words, one need consider what a gift is. When I present a gift to someone, it is with no strings attached, no expectation of reciprocity, free to the receiver and not something that was earned. A reward, on the other hand, is something that was earned. So when the boss gives you a gift, such as a Christmas bonus, it is something you earned. Our health care and compensation is none, neither. We worked hard for this. It was fought for with the blood, sweat, and dying breaths of our beloved September 11th responders and survivors. It was more than paid for with the ocean of tears shed as friends and family watched and continue to watch those we love in pain or slowly fade away. We travailed mountains of rubble, paperwork, and sorted through the lies both then and now to finally receive what is in fact an acknowledgement, a confirmation that we, or our loved ones, are sick, dying, or already dead. That those murdered by an act of terrorism unprecedented in our nation's history were not murdered on September 11th alone, but in all these years later, numbering over 1,800 and whose numbers are guaranteed to continue in the years to come. No, not a gift, but a long overdue recognition that many who were working at any of the attack sites or survived the initial attacks are sick and or have had our lives cut short. The Zadroga Health Care and Compensation Act is in fact a certificate of services rendered again, not a gift. The relief of some of the stress now knowing we have health care and acknowledgement there are indeed unique identifiers that are def defined from our exposures to the toxic dust and chemical cocktails we inhaled, ingested, and digested in the days, weeks, and months that followed are simply that, a relief. No, the legislation won't necessarily save any lives. But this long overdue permanent passage for our certified related health care issues will provide many with some extensions to their lives by providing the needed medical care and therein lend to our overall quality of life and some peace of mind. As such, this long overdue passage allows for us not to have to choose between paying for a cancer treatment or keeping a roof over our heads and food on the table. It is the ultimate much fought for certificate of triumph and a moral example of what our nation was meant to be in honoring those who serve. We are the veterans of those times. We are the 9-11 family and together we are a formidable force. You helped made this happen. Your blood, sweat and tears along with the last breaths of all those we serve as witness for. Have a Merry Christmas and a new year filled with renewal to embrace every moment we have together with remembrance, always, for all the empty chairs at our tables and what healing is possible for the bruises and scars that com comprise the character of our hearts. There you go. Thank you so very much for reading that off. You know, oh, we hear all too often like this was some gift that was given to us and it wasn't. And I, I hope that essay um, that I had written and posted with our group helped drive that home. And I, I do believe we have Liam on the air now. Liam, are you there? I am. Hi, Claudia. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm well. I did, um, I did a little bit of information on you because we couldn't find you on with us before, but I'm going to ask that you go ahead and, and explain yourself who you were with, um, at the time of the attacks, that where you responded out of, where you live now, and your work at the site. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I'm happy to do that. Uh, I was actually an Army officer uh, in the Army Chemical Corps. And, uh, time of the attack, uh, I was just going to be assigned to uh, U.S. Army Soldier Biological Chemical Command out of Aberdeen Proving Ground. And I happened to be uh, at home on leave uh, the morning of 9-11 after just returning from Korea. Uh, and I received a phone call uh, 
by about 11 a.m. Uh, from our army at Seacom, uh to deploy the city to link up with uh, what were then called raid teams, uh, that are now uh, Army National Guard civil support teams that provide uh, chemical and biological uh, reconnaissance. I think there was a there was an immediate concern, at least in the the biochemical community, that there could have been anthrax aboard the aircraft. Um, and so I ended up uh, down on the scene uh, early in the afternoon, and um, I ended up staying on site. Uh, until uh, it was, uh, I believe it was Saturday, the, the following Saturday night. So just about a, just about a week, uh, and I was unable to perform the mission uh, that I was set down to do, which was coordinate with the civil support teams, because their equipment jammed up almost immediately. They were using they were using gas chromatograph, max spectrometers to kind of pull thing pull uh Particulate matter in and analyze it, and there was just so much debris in the air uh, that they uh, that that they weren't functional. Uh, and so I ended up uh, on the bucket brigades, working on the pile, uh, performing search and rescue for most of that week. You went through a lot, so uh, Claudia might have had to excuse herself there just for a second, uh, Elam and. When you say that you were trying to, when you were trying to recover, uh, I, I can't imagine what that was like. Um, I mean, you just don't know what you'll find when you're on that pile. You, well, and I, I think probably some of the, the more, I mean, obviously the entire experience was, was really emotional, really moving, obviously life-changing for all of us that were involved in it. Uh, I the, some of the memories that stand out the most to me uh, were really the, the trauma of coming across uh, remains or, or, or a personal artifact of someone that, uh, that, that we were hoping to find alive. Uh, and there are, there are a couple, couple of memories that I have that, uh, at least for the moment, I've chosen to keep them to myself um, that were just really deeply moving because... Uh, it, it, it's clearly not something any of us woke up that morning uh, and thought would ever happen. Um, and so, you know, to be a part of that, um, at least to me, has been uh, a, a life-changing experience. I, I think like so many of us that were there, um, I'm relatively fortunate for most of the time that I was there. Uh, I was wearing a respirator, and while well, I had some health issues, and I was actually injured um, <clears throat> doing search and rescue work, while I was on the site, um, I'm, I, I consider myself really fortunate that, um, that the, the health problems I have ex that I've experienced aren't as bad as what everyone else uh, seems to be experiencing, but that too is, uh, I think, uh, you know, to some degree, at least in, in retrospect, looking at it, it was a risk that we all took and no recognized uh, that, that we did because it was worth the effort to help find people that might have been alive and to help everyone for what happened. Well, it's well, you know, when we think about the military response, of course, what comes to mind was the Pentagon. But I know also that uh, military responded to all three attack sites, and we had a, a good um, representation of a variety of different military um, uh, troops come in. And who else was on your team? How many people came in with you, Liam? Uh, I actually deployed by myself. With it was it was that ad hoc. Um, I was literally on the phone. You and I have a common link with uh, with SBCCom. I was on the phone with the the commanding general, um, Bill Dozberg, at the time, uh, and he asked me to go, and um, and so I did. And I think it's more just uh, a coincidence that I happened to be on leave. In Connecticut, at my folks' house, we were about 50 mile, 55 miles away uh, at the time, and so the goal was clearly to, to link up with the National Guard assets uh, that were there. And at least to my, I only wanted, I, I think, maybe a handful of uh, active duty Army officers that were deployed, at least in New York City. Uh, I spent a lot of time uh, 
working with the, the National Guard folks uh, that deployed there uh, earlier the, that evening. <clears throat> there, uh, there weren't a whole lot of uh, regular Army officers and soldiers that ended up deployed up there, uh, unless they were in, I believe, unless they were in support of the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, and, and that support, at least the active duty military support, didn't come or arrive uh, until a few days later. And I know I saw a lot of the uh, guard guys coming down and they were providing security around the perimeter for us. And they yeah, were wonderful. And, and they, they were terrific. And in fact, the first night, um, the first night, the, the, a lot of the, the coordination that I did uh, with the National Guard folks uh, occurred out of the, uh, the triage center that was at One Liberty Plaza uh, at the time. Uh, and so they, the, the guys that, that came in there uh, from the guard, they were they were absolutely phenomenal, and you know, and they, I think they they understood the gravity of of what was going on, and really did their best to help out everyone uh, from the city of New York that was really mostly impacted. But you know, these are all kids and uh, that that uh, that are from the area too. So you know, this is a tragedy that affected them just as personally. Absolutely. And then how long did you um, remain at the site? I, I was there for a total of, would have been five days. And I, I took a couple breaks in between to actually go back to my folks' house in Connecticut and, and just take a shower, which I, I know a lot of people didn't have an opportunity to do. But um, I, I stepped out for you know, probably eight hours, uh, all told, during that, yeah, during, during the five days. So... Um, yeah, well, living so close to home, that would have been a lot easier to do. You know, yeah. I know a lot of guys weren't even wanting to stay at any of the, um, the stations and stuff. It, of course, it opened up, you know, anybody that needed a place to lie down. And it took a little while before the spirit cruises down at the docks had set up Red Cross and spirit cruises down at the docks had set up a respite center. And over at St. John's, just outside of the site, also set up a respite center. St. Paul's Chapel, of course, and St. Peter's. There were a lot of places where um, a lot of the responders were going just to, to catch a little sleep. But trying to get a shower was, that was a trick to try yeah. to get that accomplished. But living so close, it would be a lot easier just to run home and get refreshed and be able to go back to action. It, uh, you know, the, I can, I think mean, one of the, the memories that stands out visibly, too, are just, you know, the number of, the number of, firefighters that were coming in and then, you know, coming off the line absolutely exhausted and just, you know, just sleeping on the street. Um, and you, you, know, you at least in, in my recollection, I, I, you know, I, I don't think I've ever seen a group of people work harder, uh, or be more focused at a single task. Um, and that, you know, those are the kind of memories that, that stand out to me, like the, the individual dedication and perseverance to what everyone was trying to accomplish. Um, and, uh, you know, I actually felt guilty taking a break and leaving the site, and I think a lot of people felt that way, too, and that was why I ended up having a lot of folks just sleeping on the streets or wherever they could get a place to lay their head down. Yeah, I was fortunate in that um, being a Jersey girl myself, I had places over in Jersey I could stay in. Our operations did set up a hotel room, which a bunch of us were in and out of sharing all the time. So trying to find a towel in there would have been a miracle in and of itself that wasn't already used up. And um, for me, I stayed at a friend's place um, over in Jersey. And so I would usually get a transport over there from one of the Port Authority officers or even NYPD took me over once, took me back over to Jersey, dropped me off. And then I'd head back down to Jersey City um, early the next morning and be back over at the site. So it was a constant cycle of in and out of New Jersey. So I was fortunate, too, in that I had a, a bed to sleep in and a shower that I could jump in. And I had a good friend there, a lifelong friend, who let me stay at her place and She'd be doing the laundry and the sheets and trying to get the smell out of the house. So I was very fortunate indeed. Now, you've been with our group for quite some time, too. I have. They're 9 11 rescue workers. I, 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 several years at least, maybe since 2010 or 11? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's about what I was thinking. 
and do you find that the group is providing you the information that you need for your health care compensation and other educational items? I, I, I do, and you know, I, I know you and I touched briefly uh, in an earlier conversation uh, you know, I've, I've been fortunate uh, as, a, uh, as a veteran to have access to the, the VA health care system, uh, which has provided me with pretty much everything that I've needed. Uh, but one of the one of the best assets that you're providing, at least for for me, is information um, on, on even health risks and things that I can expect. And it's it, it's the the group in that respect has been really dynamic and really phenomenal because you you get a sense a shared sense of experience uh, with with all of the members, and because we're all going through a lot of the same thing to some degree. I'm always very pleased with the peer support because that's really how this group started out. was about peer support. That's what I did when I was at the, at the site. It was about peer support and trying to mitigate some of the effects of um, post-traumatic stress that, you know, would eventually overcome us anyway because it was just such a different site to work at the time. And so I think the peer support was in the group. You know, I know there's other military members in there. I think you're a little bit more active than some of them. Some people stay pretty quiet to themselves, but they jump out every once in a while and they'll make contact with somebody like yourself. Hey, I was there too, and I'm military. And and that, at least to me, as you know, as as a as a military guy, as someone you know, and like every, I think, I mean, all of us, to some degree, that we're in some kind of law enforcement, public safety, military, you know, we know and understand uh, the value of a, a, a team. Uh, and a, in large part, what you put together is, is, a, is a team uh, where we can lean on each other uh, for support, for advice, um, and even just to, you know, to be a listening ear when people need to, people need to vent. Um, and that brings together a dynamic, a, I think makes everyone feel close. And, and no, I didn't catch it earlier because I was trying to get a hold of our other guests. I'm not sure what happened, but there's must got hung up somewhere. So I'm not sure if you hit on this or not. But when you were at the site, did you uh, mention you had a piece of concrete that had fallen on you? And well, I, I I mentioned briefly that I was injured. Yes, <laughs> I, 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 although I didn't I didn't uh, go into detail, but that is that is in fact correct. And yeah, I, but. It took a it took a number of surgeries to, to fix. Um, and honestly, I, when I was injured, I, I I didn't even realize how serious it was at the time. I just kept working. Um, you know, it was uh, it was only afterwards that uh, that I realized, wow, um, I think I, I really hurt myself. I think a lot of people don't realize. You know, it was an amazing phenomena in and of itself that we worked down there for so many months. I mean, the last day of operations when they took out the final um, piece of steel beam was May 30th of 2002. And in all that time, there was almost no injuries. There was no deaths, you know, nothing of it, you know, very mini minimal amount of injuries uh, for a site that huge and as massive and as dangerous as it was. That's that phenomenal. Yeah, and I think that speaks a lot um, to um, the, the safety component that people realize uh, was going to be pretty critical to the recovery process. And that, uh, during my time frame there, during the, the especially during the first few days, um, they, they, clearly everyone threw caution to the wind, um, and we were obviously dealing with, I, I think, debris unlike anyone has ever really seen uh, in the mm -hmm. past. And so, you know, um, you know, I, it, it, to have something like that go on with so few injuries, um, you know, and there were, I think there were a lot of guys that were getting nicked, cuts, at, and just as banged up as I was uh, the, the, those first few days. Um, but uh, it's pretty amazing that it, it went on to continue that kind of recovery without any injuries, given how complicated of a site it is. Well, and do you remember um, the Deutsch building, the tall building that loomed over us? Okay. Yes. They had a fire there even years later that actually killed a couple of uh, responders of DNY that had right. been there on 9-11. Yeah. It, 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 
probably about 70 stories tall, I believe. And I remember, you know, we're talking about the Army folks, and uh, I was, I noticed they had put up some, uh, you know, that crime scene tape, you know, to keep people from walking in front of it for a while. And that was well after um, the attacks. So it was into October when they finally put some tape up around it. And I was talking to one of the Army Corps of Engineer fellows, and he was saying, you know, I, he goes, the public doesn't know this, but this building could come down on us at any time. We're taking on so much water. And I think a lot of the responders there, of course, knew this was going on, but it wasn't public knowledge, and I don't know that it's been talked about much since. But that building was expected to come down because it had been taking on so much water. They had um, huge pumps and six-inch lines trying to feed that water back out into the Hudson River um, to try to keep that building from collapsing on top of us. And so the scene was dangerous in so many ways, even over and beyond um, digging through the rubble. You know, if that building had come down on us, I can't even imagine uh, the horror that that would have been. But we kept working because that's who we are. It's not yeah, just what and we it's who we are. And you know, you you realize that you realize that you're in you're you're in danger um, when you're there. But but I I think that. That too is kind sort of part of uh, part of a commitment to, to duty that people have, and they understand that you know this is a you take on inherent risks with a job, um, and you do that job anyway because the, the greater good is uh, is ultimately who you're trying to serve. And I I, I can certainly I can certainly remember uh, the, the the first evening of. Uh, being on scene before World Trade Center Seven collapsed, um, and that was petrifying. Um, you know, it uh, it really you just uh, to to know that you're in there uh, and you're at that kind of risk, and then to have something to be able to get out of the area and have another building collapse. I mean, it just it, it, there was that ever present sense of danger that was there, at least for the period of time that I was there. Uh huh. Well, you know, and, and uh, I'm sure you must have been had a hard hat or some a little bit of protection. You know, the boy, I, I, I did. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I had a, uh, I, I had a Kevlar hat on most of the time, anyway. Uh, and I remember one I, time I was. Go ahead. Go ahead with what you were saying, Liam. I'm sorry. Oh, oh, uh, yeah, and you know, I was fortunate enough to have, uh, have. Uh, personal protective equipment and a respirator uh, for the time that I was there, um, and uh, I think in, I think in large part having worn the respirator uh, may have saved me from uh, at least uh, the, the the early onset of uh, uh, some of the diseases that uh, that uh, kind of signature illnesses for, for the site. Yeah, but like you were even telling me the other day, you know that you couldn't even wear that respirator and. Yeah, I was on the, 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 I, I mean, I brought three filters with me, uh, and by the third day, uh, I had gone through all of those filters, um, and, you know, the, the air was just so thick that, uh, the, the respirator was kind of pointless because it wasn't, it was, it, it, the filters were choking up, uh, but you still try, yeah. at least I tried to wear it, uh, having a chemistry back. And I know that, um... On the hazardous materials tack, um, I was prior to the attacks, and I know you worked at SBCCOM. That's one of the things that made them want to hire me on over there was my background in emergency services and being a hazmat tack. And so we, you would think, we know, you know, but if the equipment isn't there for us to use, no matter how much you know, you're still going to do the job at hand. Correct. And I think yeah, that's yeah. an important point for people to understand. It, it is. It is, and for uh, at least for me, I knew that whether I had the equipment or not, I was still going to be there, and I was still going to do the job that I, I was sent down there to do. Um, and you, know, you you also realize too that um, it's okay to accept some personal risk when you're when when there were potentially so many lives at stake to be saved. It, uh, at least as a human being, I feel that it's worth taking a, a, a risk like that um, to help other people. I, and I, I think that's kind of a large part what uh, a lot of people that are called called to public service uh, tend to feel that way as well. 
And it's really important to hold on to that, you know, to know that, that folks went in, you went in, did the right thing, you know, trying to do rescue. Because when we first went there, it was still a rescue mission. Recovery came right. almost like a month later by the time they actually officially deemed it a, a recovery site. And I think a lot of folks have difficulty uh, within our community that were down there um, because we never got anybody out. There was no rescues. After that first 12 hours, there was right. no rescues. Just like the medical teams were amazed that they didn't have the casualties coming into the hospitals and that that they had expected and prepped for. Um, very, very hard for people to adjust to that. Yeah, and, and so that's there. I have to agree. I think one of the more haunting memories that I have, uh, we're seeing what what I what I thought might have been a mile of ambulance lined up um, coming down um, across uh, uh, just to cross over the Brooklyn Bridge. I, I've, I've been out of the city so long; I don't remember the road anymore. Uh, but you know, and uh, to know that the uh, you know. They, they had a lot of anticipation that there would be survivors, uh, and and after that first day, there were not. <laughs> yeah, it was really I think, very hard, and it, it still haunts a lot of our friends that were down there. Um, trying to rescue their friends, you know, because everybody knew their, their friends and their buddies were under that stuff. And so, yeah, the psychological damage that goes on, you know, is something to be reckoned with. And so I think that the point of we're down there doing the right thing, did everything that we humanly could, you know, needs to constantly be reinforced. You know, you did everything you could and it just was meant to be. I have to agree. Yeah, it's very hard for for people. I got a question. Now, the other person that I had hoped to have on today was um, was with me at the site. Um, since I expect that this is going to be our last official Claudia and Friends show since we've now uh, closed out on Sedroga, and, and we thank God and thank uh, Dave and Jeff for everything they, they've done for us. But I thought maybe I'd touch a little bit, and that's why I was hoping she'd be on, but she must have got hung up somewhere to talk a little bit about our operations down there. The uh, Port Authority of New York and New Jersey owns the site, uh, on the buildings. They take care of all the bridges, tunnels, uh, and other uh, airports in the area, pretty much all of them. And so they took a very hard hit on 9-11, which is oftentimes kind of lost in the numbers that we hear for NYPD or FDNY. The Port Authority Police Department, PAPD, lost 37 officers and one canine, the only canine that was killed during the attacks whose owner, um, David Lim, a really remarkable, wonderful guy, had to um, put um, Sirius, was the dog's name, uh, in its kennel that morning and then go out to help rescue people. And he has quite a story of his own that's been uh, been told many times. And so Sirius passed, uh, perished that day. Um, they lost 37 officers in the canine. And then civilian employees, because they own those buildings, they have most of their offices were in those buildings. They also have headquarters in Jersey City and other satellite areas, but Port Authority has offices in the World Trade Centers. And so they also, on top of the 37 officers in K-9, they lost 39 civilian employees. So when one um, puts that against the overall number of employees or officers that they had, they, by ratio, they actually lost more than even the fire department did that day at 343, when you figure out how many employees they had to hit those that perished on 9-11. And everybody, of course, has taken hard hits since. So what happened with um, with our team, there was a setup for New Jersey uh, Critical Incident Stress Management. And the New Jersey Critical Incident Stress Management team was uh, headed by a man by the name of Roland Candle. And Roland was a prior Vietnam veteran. 
um, had uh, also served as a fire chief down in Vineland, New Jersey, and he ran our operations. Uh, other teams would come in. We had people from around the country. A lot of these folks from up in uh, Massachusetts came in to help out with uh, CISM. And uh, we had Canadians come in, chaplains from around the country. Uh, a few of those that I would mention would be Kathy Minahan and Claudia Hall, Pat Marsters, and Denise Ellis. Denise Ellis um, passed away two years ago. Uh, they all came in as part of the WINGS which is a SISM program out of Boston. They came in to help out. We had Dan Chapman, who is a chaplain out of Texas. We had people like Malcolm Wilson come in out of Canada. And, of course, all the officers and other people that helped provide us transport uh, back and forth from Jersey City over to the site. Um, really a remarkable group of people, a uh, remarkable organization. And at that, I'd like to remember Roland Candle. Um, Roland ran our operations right up until New Year's Eve of that year. He was there all the time with very few breaks to go back down the island, uh, which is just South Jersey, a few hours away. And uh, he passed away of a massive heart attack uh, 10 days later after our operations ended. So people like that need to also be remembered. I know that our bill is called Sajoga. That's named after James Sajoga, who was an NYPD officer who died of 9-11 related illness. His father, Joe, a real nice guy, he's also a member of our group, um, really helped push this 9-11 health care back then. And because of uh, James being um, out there in uh, public, the bill was named after James Sajoga. There have been many other people that have died even before Jimmy did. Um, we call it the Zadroga Bill. We honor him, but we honor everybody. And that includes, like, everybody from the Red Cross and the Salvation Army and all the hard hats and the iron workers, all these military folks that came in, the, all the law enforcement agencies. Bergen County came in, Hudson County came in, uh, sheriff's deputies and police officers. And I just want to make sure they all know that we remember them all and that we're all one big family together, that no one group, no one agency lords over the other. And that's what we're about. That's what 9-11 Rescue Workers and Friends is about. It's about all of us working together towards a common cause, and our common cause right now has been Sutroga. And now it's reauthorized, and it wasn't a Christmas gift. We worked hard for it. People have died for it. And as a matter of fact, on the day, on Friday, when the Joga bill was passed, we lost another FDNY responder to brain cancer. He's only 57 years old by the name of Kevin Nerney. So these losses, of course, are going to continue, but at least we have some relief knowing that our health care coverage is taken care of. And again, I can't thank Jeff and Dave. have been wonderful. Uh, uh, Liam, I thank you so much for coming on this last show with me. Uh, I know these guys have invited me to come back for updates and if we have events and different things coming on, and I, I so much appreciate that also. But this is never about Claudia. This is about Claudia's friends <laughs> and our group. And so I thank, thank you all very much. It's been an honor and a, and a privilege. And, I, and while I, I know you want to say that this is not about you, um, Claudia, you deserve a lot of recognition uh, for all the work that you've done for everyone. It, 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 pulling all of this together uh, <coughs> for, uh, of inspiration and strength for everyone. So um, so I want to thank you personally for that. And, and also say Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays to everyone out there. Can I catch you, brother? Can I catch you? Uh, Jeff, Dave, did you have anything else? Well, I just, uh, it's been an honor to have you guys on our radio show and to learn about the many different stories that your guests have shared with our listening audience. And wow, some of them were, <laughs> I mean, they're all important without a doubt. Each one's unique, but you guys went through a lot. I mean, I tried to look up to see how big the footprint of each tower was but when you take a hundred plus story structure that's collapsed within its own footprint and you try to wrap your brain around all of the debris that's associated with that that's just you have to be there to understand it probably 
and uh, it was a 16 acre square site and next September we hope to we're working right now on a an event our group will be having uh, back in New York and New Jersey and boy wouldn't it be lovely if maybe Dave and Jeff would make it back to New York and you can do your radio show out of there maybe <laughs> for the 15th anniversary we'd love to have you yeah, be, uh, maybe by then we can do remotes. It's just so hard for us to, I mean, Jeff could. He could call in, but it's hard for me to leave. But uh, that's awful nice of you to say that. Um, you know, we feel like... I'd be glad to show you around the city, and I'll take it to the museum myself. Wow. Um, I mean, I can't imagine what it's like to be in your all shoes to have such a connection with an event like that. And ladies and gentlemen, these people went towards the the event they didn't run away they went towards it and stood on it and helped in everywhere that they in every way that they could so uh, it's just amazing what they've been through and uh, well I, I want to say I'm sorry I wanted to say thank you again to uh, Dell Wilbur who first put us together you know he was a that little um, wonderful voice that was friends with you guys and brought me into this show, which has given us all such a voice. So thanks again to Dell. Yep. He's, uh, he knows a lot of folks, uh, Claudia, and uh, the man just does. He just he sees a connection and he just does. He gets it done. So um, very unique individual. And I'm, I'm glad that uh, we've been able to share time together and ladies and gentlemen claudia said sincerely when she called me yesterday she says you know it's you probably need to take a good nap don't you claudia <laughs> <laughs> yes very much so <laughs> well it, it, you know when you when you have the responsibility you feel the responsibility as all of your all the folks that are associated with the 9 11 rescue workers and friends um you know, you don't rest really in your mind until that until something is handled, that there's a solution, and you don't stop thinking about it until that's done, right? You know, it, it's kind of like um, I believe it was Terry Rivera from Ten House when he was on the show with us, and we both concurred on this that once the yoga was done, we really would like nothing better than to move on with our lives. You know, to just deal with their own um, health issues and just. Just go on and, and grab that quality of life. And so that's what we're all able to do finally. You know, the relief, the stress is over, the, the, uh, the boulders off of our shoulders, so to speak, and we can start moving forward and, and just grieve because there's still a lot of grieving ahead of us. And uh, we're there for one another. People like Liam and like everybody else in that group, um, they're really a remarkable, wonderful um, membership that we've got. We've got the cream of the crop. You do. And uh, I'm just trying to think. You, you know, in order to appreciate things, ladies and gentlemen, sometimes you just have to think, just imagine, what happens if these people wouldn't have acted upon going over there and helping with that site? Just imagine. That's the difference between these people and other folks around the world. These people act. And I didn't. They did. I mean, that's that's. I'm learning from you folks, and it's just in you to that. These people came from every state in the country to go help, and that's what's really fascinated me. Uh, when you had people from San Francisco and and other areas of the country that uh, went immediately, they stopped their job and went to go help. That's that's just mind boggling, and that's what what we both did that are on today. So uh, thank you for having that. And isn't that what makes America great? Isn't that what really makes America great? You know, that everybody just pulls together at our, our lowest points, you know, and then we're, we're all wonderful and patriotic and we love one another and we need to hold on to that. You know, that, that sadly doesn't last long enough and God forbid, but we all know that it's inevitable that one of these days we're going to get hit again. We got hit in San Bernardino we're going to get hit again. And I don't think we need to wait until that moment to pull together again as a nation and to just love one another. Because in the end, 
That's all there is. It's all about love. That's what our group is about. That's what the show has been about. And when I say I love you, I mean it from the heart. And I love you guys. Well, all of you guys. We love you too. And thanks for everything you've done, Claudia. And is it, say your first name again. Is it, is it Elam? Is, is that, am I? Oh, Liam. Liam. Okay, Liam. Liam, yes. Okay, well, I'm sorry that old Dave's got his, when I have a new name that I haven't heard very many times, it takes me a while to get a hang of it, so I apologize for that. I completely understand. So, the next show will be on uh, Irish name affiliations. Yes. <laughs> it will be about the Irish names. Liam is uh, Irish for William. <laughs> and, it, and it means determined, which I, I, I think uh, suits the personality of everyone that, uh, that, that responded that day, not, not just myself. Wait, you know what my last name means? It means I'm, right. I'm setting myself up here. I'm, my last name <laughs> is spelled R A A F, and it means raven. You know, like a like the bird. Isn't that like a scavenger bird? Oh, it's the most That's intelligent of all crap. birds. Is a raven. Hey, oh, raven. Oh, I thought it was <laughs> like a crow. <laughs> <laughs> no, the ravens, you know, read that around and you'll know that those ravens. Well, they must I know know my name, uh, Claudia, by its literal sense, really kind of sucks. But <laughs> when I pulled up a Bible verse, um, somebody, uh, one of the Christian groups a long time ago, had put out a meaning, a Christian meaning, attached to a name. And my name means protector. Oh. And the verse that's attached to it is about um, uh, rising up with wings of eagles. And so I've always very much felt attached to that. And the ravens is the Thomas. That's the last name. And three ravens was the family crest, which dates back way, way back. Wow. So I like ravens. So it's a good good meaning for your name there, Dave. Well, I thought it was. <laughs> and yeah. Jeff is staying very quiet right now, and I don't know why. <laughs> well, I, I think they forgot to sprinkle some of that intelligence dust on my head. It must uh, they must have uh, just skipped me. But anyway, that's all right. I appreciate you guys and and listening to our listening audience, learning about what uh, your message is, Claudia. And we're gonna when Claudia has something that's going on with the nine eleven organization, the uh, rescue. Uh, workers and friends and she's going to say hey dave we went on and i want to communicate she will be back on and, and she has something she wants to post and we'll forward it on to both of our platforms we'll be glad to do that as well so uh it's very nice to have gotten to know you guys and thanks for stepping up thank you all thank you Liam. okay let's go ahead Go ahead, Liam. Well, I just wanted to say it was a pleasure, and uh, and thank you for hosting the show. Uh, it's great to be able to uh, be a part of what is really the oral history of, uh, of one of the greatest events that's occurred in our country. Um, and uh, I, I'm proud of uh, being a part of that and uh, everyone that I was there with. Well, you know, um, I, you know, I like to give a quote during these different shows, and the one I'm going to close off with today is from General George Patton. Now, everybody knows George Patton. Well, he passed away 70 years ago today, which, and he was just a remarkable, remarkable general of the greatest generation. And what he said was, it is foolish and wrong to mourn the men who died. Rather, we should thank God that such men lived. Amen. Way to be, Claudia. And women, too. <laughs> well, when I don't know why it is that when we're talking about people, you know, it's people, right? It's folks. So, Amen. There you go. Amen. Men and women of all types. So, enjoyed having you, Claudia. Have, Eva, a, have a blessed have day. Have a blessed Christmas. And Merry Christmas to you guys. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.